I understand for some people that can be frightening, that can be scary, but that's also the beauty of the business world is it allows for a lot of creativity. There are so many different paths. And what I would say to that is, and, and a tip for people that are doing the internship and, and even those that aren't, set yourself up for as many options as possible. So make, create as many doors for yourself as you can. And really think about it like the, the, there's a, a word serendipity that I think about a lot. And it's about just putting yourself in different situations where great things can happen. And I really think about throughout my, my career, I've thought, how do I manufacture more serendipity? Ryan Coon is an entrepreneur, advisor, and angel investor. Most recently, Ryan led the rentals business at Realtor.com after successfully selling his last venture-funded company to Realtor.com in December of 2020. Prior to that, Ryan was the CEO of Avail, a platform that improves the rental experiences for more than 2 million do-it-yourself landlords and renters. Before co-founding Avail in 2015, Ryan was an investment banking associate at BMO Capital Markets performing M&A and equity capital market transactions for financial services firms. You'll hear on today's episode him talk about what it was like to be in the investment banking industry during the financial crisis. Ryan lives in Chicago, is active in the tech community with over 50 angel investments and serves on a board of directors for La Casa Norte, an organization fighting youth and family homelessness in Chicago. He earned his bachelor's of science degree in accounting and finance with honors from the University of Illinois Champaign and is a CollegeWorks intern alum. All right, Ryan, welcome to the show, man. We're so pumped to have you. We go way back. Um, I can't believe it. We both interned in the same year in Illinois in 2004, right? Gosh, it's been so long, but really good to reconnect and see you, Sean. Um, man, I, I can't believe uh, after all these years, we got a chance to hang out and talk about your career and share with um, people what you did and and kind of your version of how to become excellent and how to build your career, build your life in this place that you want to be in and achieve the goals you want to have. So um, we like to start off with just really getting some background. I want to talk about, you know, all the things that you did early in life. So maybe some reminiscing for you, take you back and trying to figure out how you kind of got on your path. Um, I mean, right now you've got an incredible opportunity. You're running the rental side of realtor.com. Yeah. Yeah. So right now I I'm running the rentals business at realtor.com. I'm in my final days or weeks here at, at the company, which is exciting uh, for me to kind of start looking forward to this next path. But really, the, the journey getting here goes way back to growing up in the suburbs of Chicago here in Illinois. I grew up around small businesses. So my dad had an insurance company. And then my parents at some point acquired or bought this um, kind of fall farm festival out near Rockford, where I know you're from. So yeah, that that small business was always in my DNA. It was always there. Um, I eventually went down to University of Illinois down in Champaign, studied finance, accounting, um, and ultimately joined a middle market investment bank right out of college in the summer of 07, doing M&A work for middle market companies right before the financial crisis. So did that for a number of years before ultimately deciding, you know, the corporate world's not for me. I'm going to go join uh, or ultimately start a, a company that became Avail, which we sold to Realtor.com in December of 2020. Holy cow. So and a lot of the young listeners are going, hey, I'm in college. I want to figure out what I want to do with my life. I can never imagine even starting a business that gets acquired by a larger company, how that all works. What do you got to do? Um, and all the, the the path that goes to that. So you've achieved something pretty special. Um, let's get into like your definition of excellence, because that's what the show's all about, is getting to that edge of excellence and really trying to achieve your, your goals. What is your definition of excellence? Yeah, well, I think what's interesting about excellence and, and the question itself is that everyone does have a different definition. And so because it is one of those softer, squishier things that you can't really 
put put a definition on the way I think about it is more just how do you know when you've seen when you see it, right? And I think about excellence as being in some ways similar to love, you know, and and love and similar in the sense that number one, you know it when you see it. So you just know we're in love, you know when you see excellence, you see greatness, you know what that looks like. Then I think number two, excellence has to entail very high results. It's high achieving, it's, you know, you're you're performing at the, the top end of your game. And then number three, I think it's not just what you're achieving, but it's how you're doing it. It's achieving it with a certain amount of grace or elegance. And one of the things I think about as a kid who grew up in the 90s watching Chicago Bulls basketball is I'm going to say something maybe unpopular, but I look at the comparison between Jordan and LeBron, right? And I look at Jordan by all definitions, excellent, you know, very high achieving, but he did it the right way. He, he was, you know, a hard worker. He played with a lot of determination, everything. You could just see and feel, and, and he exuded excellence. You compare that to LeBron, who maybe, you know, flops or complains to the refs or, or something. Like, that's not really elegant. While he's a, a freak of nature, he's an incredible basketball player and has achieved at that very high, high end of the spectrum, he's not maybe doing it the most gracefully. And so I, I bring that up almost as, as kind of a, an example that a lot of the listeners would probably relate to and understand is, you know, so, so to summarize, excellence is three things. Number one, you know it when you see it. Number two, high results. Number three, it's done with a certain amount of elegance, grace, authenticity that really makes you just go, wow. Holy cow. So this isn't a sports show, but I got to ask. If LeBron stays in Cleveland for his entire career and they win a few championships, does that change your view of how he did it? Very good question. I, I Probably a little bit, right? Because I think that's another one of the differences between Jordan, who stayed not his entire career because he had a stint with the Wizards. But, I mean, he he was dedicated to the city of Chicago. I think had LeBron not done his stints in Miami, LA, et cetera, like may, maybe it does because part of LeBron is he's just out there chasing championships. Um, whereas as Jordan stuck with one city, one team, and really brought everyone else around him along for the ride. Love it. And the industry's changed. The, the game has changed a little bit too. So, um, so excellence is knowing it when you see it, you got to achieve huge results and then how you do it, the way you do it. Um, are you, do you believe like the way you do anything is the way you do everything? Like excellence doesn't just happen in one area of life. It's something you got to try to achieve everywhere. Yes, I, I do think that's right. I think that people who are wired to achieve excellence in one part are typically pursuing that in all parts of their life. I would say the difference is, and you and I have talked about this a bit before, but I think you you can have everything, you can do everything really well, but you can't necessarily do it all well at the same time, if that makes sense. So I look at, I mean, for myself, when I was starting Avail, right, I put 100% of my effort into making the company successful. I, how I moved across the country in order to do an accelerator program out in the Bay Area where I knew no one. And so what did I do at the time? I, I unfortunately had to put some family relationships, my girlfriend relationships on hold for that certain period of time. So was I pursuing excellence with my business with Avail? Undoubtedly, like I was all in, 100% in. Was I excellent with family and friends at that time? No, I, I was probably a bit absent. I wasn't fully, fully there. So that, that's where I think, you know, I, I, I think you can be excellent in one thing at one time. 
and and you can pursue excellence across the board. You can, you just can't be excellent at everything all at the same time. Yeah, I think a lot of people search for balance. They they want to find that balance in their daily life of I've got to do it all. I've got to um, you know have that relationship with every single person in my life while achieving success at work, while being in peak physical condition, while while eating perfectly, while following all the you know personal financial advice I can. And, and I'm trying to do it all. And, and one thing I've come to learn is that balance is about balance for your life and not today or for the week or for the month. And that, you know, I can achieve a balanced life by working really hard when I'm young. So working super hard in my 20s or 30s is going to make it a lot more balanced when I'm in my 40s and 50s. Um, and so I don't have to work until I'm, you know, 75 years old. So balance isn't just measured in a day or a week. It can really be measured over a lifetime. Yeah, hundred percent. And the one one nuance that I would maybe throw in there, and I'd like all of our listeners to think about this, is maybe consider swapping the word balance, which does mean kind of I think drastic trade offs, and and replace it with the word harmony, and think about more this you know this flowing relationship or between different things where it it's not one or the other. It's just that one may be less important or less prioritized today. And and there can be that harmonious relationship between the, the two different things. I love that. I love that. So let's go back again to the early stuff. So what were you like? Uh, I mean, you did the college works internship, but, but even before that, you hinted at a little bit. What kind of stuff did you do in high school and jo- early jobs, early extracurricular activities? Yeah. I mean, growing up, I was really trying to do a, do a little bit of everything. Um, which, you know, we'll talk about more, but I think was maybe a a problem, but I was trying to do sports and I was trying to run cross country, play football, play basketball, run track. And I, uh, while also being involved in, you know, the accounting club and scholastic bowl and all of, all of those different activities. Um, I think growing up, what I found, if I really reflect back on it was, I had these like almost two competing forces in my head. And on one hand, I had my parents who were these entrepreneurial, hardworking people who really can't like their, their childhood, they grew up essentially poor middle America. And they were like, look, just enjoy childhood and be, you know, just enjoy experiencing different things. Don't push yourself too hard. Don't, it's not all about high achievement. On the other hand, I was also in the suburbs of Chicago and in a great high school and surrounded by people who were high achieving. And so throughout high school, throughout college, I I almost had these like dueling forces in my head where it was like, look, just enjoy the moment, work hard, and eventually things will work out. And you're going to probably start a business or do something. And you know, achieving straight A's at the moment, who cares? Because that's not ultimately what's going to determine your success in life. On the other hand, I did have these very high achieving people surrounding me. And the competitive part of me was like, look, I can run with them. I can do this. I can do that. So that that was a bit of kind of my childhood grow, growing up. And then even, even in college, frankly, it was, look, I, I wanted to achieve great things. I also wanted to be out there and partying with all my friends and and really trying to play both sides of it, um, which I ultimately realized you can't you can't do everything all at once. Back to our earlier point. Absolutely. And you, so you're that competitive part of like, I got to get into the best college. I got to get the best scholarship. I got to. Um, get into the right, you know, social club or organization or, uh, you know, Greek life's huge at the University of Illinois where you went to school and, uh, you know, all these different areas I got to try to compete and be in, involved in, uh, but I'm supposed to just be young and happy and enjoy myself. Uh, that could be really tough. So what was your motivation? Like what drove you to go? I, I do want to compete with some of these other people in, in my age group. Yeah, I think what what it ultimately was is there was a moment in college where I did try to take a step back and take a more long view and say, look, where, where do I want to be when I'm 30? And in college, that feels like so far away, right? And 
but I, but I sat there and I said, where, where do I ultimately want to be? And then how do I work backwards from that point? And what decisions can I make today that will ultimately set me up for that, that better future? And so for me, what I decided was, look, I, I know at some point I'm either going to start a business or buy a business. And what do I need to do today to get there? And for me, I said, look, when I want to do those things, I'm going to need capital. Like you, you need a certain amount of cash in the bank to either start a, start a company or buy one. And then in college, I said, look, what's the best way to do that? And for me, I said, look, the best way to do that is to get a job working 100 hours a week in investment banking, put in the three years, grind it out as an analyst, live really, you know, within my means, save as much as I can. So that at the end of a three year analyst period at a, at a bank, I could take time off and, and either go buy a business or, or start one. Um, and that's what I did. That was my journey to kind of saying, look, how, how did I deal with that trade off between trying to enjoy college, but also achieving, achieving a lot? Got it. So, uh, what did you major in at the University of Illinois? So, I I initially actually went into University of Illinois as an entrepreneurship major, which is such a BS t- like major because entrepreneurship you can't study in school. You can't. Matt and I just talked about this. That was in my episode where we said, "Hey, if you're going to want to do entrepreneurship, it's a nice thing to have in school, but like use your college to learn." things about maybe the industry you want to do entrepreneurship in. So um, you went into real estate, you went into, uh, you know, technology and real estate. So maybe learn how to code or learn how to uh, some computer engineering courses or learn uh, property development, take some, you know, city planning courses, but don't take get some entrepreneurship classes. Uh, yeah. Get some actual skills. Skills. Yeah. So, absolutely. so, so eventually I pivoted. I, I went down the finance path. I, that's actually where I met my co-founder was taking real estate finance classes at the University of Illinois. And then at some point, kind of touching on high achieving, I was like, well, if I stay down here for a summer and I cram in 15 hours of courses over the summer, then I could get to a point of having a double major, get, get to the 150 hours needed for that. And so I did that. I tacked on on a degree. And so ultimately had the finance degree, the accounting degree, and that's what kind of the chocolate and peanut butter that set me up for getting a job in investment banking, um, which ultimately gave me the the capital to go start a veil. Love it. And then, so what year did you intern with CollegeWorks? I interned with CollegeWorks in the summer of 04. And what year in school were you then? That was right immediately after my freshman year. Right after freshman year. Wow. So same thing. So I, I was a freshman at St. Louis University in 2004, driving up to Rockford to do college works 300 miles to get home and uh, sell paint jobs on the weekends in the spring and then in the snow. Uh, and <laughs> Oh, yeah. And then all of my payrolls were in your area in the summer. We had to go to Chicago for all the payroll events. We had some really good events and, and awesome speakers. A really fun time. So um, so that's was that the hardest you had worked? Hands down, hands down. Um, and, and it was hard and it was also brand new, right? It was when you're out selling and marketing and, and pitching people on these thousands of dollars of painting jobs and proposals and stuff like that is all brand new for a a kid in college. Yeah. So at this, at any of those points, I mean, you mentioned, yeah, I'm studying accounting, I'm studying finance, I'm interested in entrepreneurship. I'm running a painting business with college works. Was there ever a, I'm going to be a property technology startup guy? Uh, that's what I'm going to try and do? No, that, that was so far kind of down the line. I At the time of being a, a freshman at University of Illinois and working and doing the college work, works internship, I mean, that spring, that summer, I was just really trying to absorb and learn what are the skills that I'm I'm able to get here and the experiences here that will ultimately set me up for whatever I want to do in life? So that, that takes a lot of foresight to say, I'm going to get 
skills and work ethic and make the money now for something I want to do in the future that I don't know what it is. Yeah, it's it's a bet and it's a it requires a certain amount of like almost optimism about the future that look, I don't know where this is going to lead and and ultimately go, but if I make the right choices, I put in the work now and I meet the people, I learn the learn the life lessons that they've acquired over their their careers um that will ultimately set me up for success yeah i think well, we've had a couple doctors on the show but there's a, there's a real clear path there of you know, i got to do this in college to get into med school then i do the med school i do the residency i'm a doctor like there's a very clear i know what i want to do in 10 or 15 years and i'm going to follow these steps to do it but there's not really that in the business world the entrepreneurship world doesn't say you know, if you do this for three years, then you'll do this for two years, then you'll do this for four years, and then you'll be, then you'll sell your company. No, it it never works out like that. There's not that like clear line, that that clear path. And I know I understand for some people that can be frightening, that can be scary, but that's also the beauty of the business world is it allows for a lot of creativity. There are so many different paths. And what I would say to that is, and and a tip for people that are doing the internship and and even those that aren't, set yourself up for as many options as possible. So make create as many doors for yourself as you can, and really think about it like the the there's a a word serendipity that I think about a lot, and it's about just putting yourself in different situations where great things can happen. And I really think about throughout my, my career, I've thought, how do I manufacture more serendipity? And so Tuesday evening, it was a beautiful, you know, spring, early summer night here in Chicago. And I had an opportunity to go to a networking event. And I said to my wife, I'm like, oh, I, you know, I'm, I would really love to stay here and, you know, hang out with you and our, our two and a half year old daughter, um, sit on the roof, have a couple of drinks, sit by the fire table, et cetera. Or I can go to this networking event. And ultimately what pushed me to go to the event was you never know who you're going to meet, what relationships are going to be there. And you really want to set yourself up with as many of those doors and as much optionality as you can. That's beautiful. So then you go into the investment banking world, which is in and of itself incredibly competitive. Just getting in the door there can be really, really difficult. And we've got a lot of students we talk to that are interested in that world. Um, so talk a little bit about that journey and how do you you know, get your foot in the door and crack through into the investment banking world? And what's that world look like? Yeah, investment banking, it is everything that you read about. It is, it is hard. It's competitive. It is a lot of work. It is a little bit of fun, but in large, it's it's just work. And so my my experience was at the University of Illinois going through the recruiting process and hearing no and no and no and no and no and no and no from I mean bank after bank after bank that I would interview with. And until eventually I got a yes. And there's so many parallels between whether it's knocking on doors to sell painting jobs, to going through that really competitive interview process, to ultimately raising money, raising venture capital for a startup, you're, you're inevitably going to hear a lot of no's if you're doing something that's really competitive and is, is kind of worth doing. So heard a lot of no's, but ultimately landed a a job in banking started in the summer of 07, right before the financial crisis. Great timing. And Great timing. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. And I got, you know, talk about again serendipity, but I ended up working in a group that what we did is we focused on financial services companies. So banks, trading firms, asset managers that all are eventually going to either raise capital or merge. 
And so I was in like the the group that was going to be affected the most by the financial crisis. So the next three years of my life were, were really spent working on mergers and acquisitions for banks and trading firms, which for a lot of our listeners, they're probably too young to remember these days, but it, it was a wild period in our country's history where these banks would essentially fail every week. And every week for about two years, the, the feds would go in, they would close down banks at 5 p.m. on a Friday and run a, a very quick rapid auction process over the weekend. And that bank would open as part of a new bank or part of a different bank on Monday morning. So rapid fire, you're waiting till 5 p.m. on a Friday. OK, which banks are getting shut? And then w those are the banks that we're ultimately going to be working with, advising, et cetera, um, over the weekend. So you're, you're just working these insane hours to ultimately keep banks afloat, keep the, the nation's you know, financial system alive. Holy so God, that's a wild experience. So yeah, I want to go back to that job search real quick. So, you, you know, I think some of the students that do an internship or they they achieve something and they think, you know, OK, I've got that credential. So I, I did the college internship. I ran a hundred thousand dollar business. You know, my resume is good. Now I can just get every job I want. And one message I try to teach at the end of the summer at our final payroll when we talk about resumes and job hunting is that not that college works or anything. You know, it doesn't matter if you've got a degree from Harvard. It doesn't matter if you've got, um, you know, whatever wards or plaques you have hanging on the wall. They aren't just going to walk. You're not just going to get every single opportunity. What you really are going to do from your college works experience is take the same skills you learned with marketing and how you found clients. And that's how you're going to find a job. You're going to scout your territory and find, you know, what are all the industries that I want to be interested in? What are all the companies in those industries? Do I want to be at a small company, mid-sized company, large company? Do I want to be in a public company, a private company? You're going to make a giant list and scout your territory. And then you're going to knock on a thousand doors. Uh, but those thousand doors aren't going to be um, homeowners that might need their house painted. It's going to be companies that might need to hire somebody to do what, whatever you want to do. Sales, marketing, management, accounting, finance, whatever. And then you're going to have you know 40 leads. And those leads are going to be saying, you know, we might be interested and you're going to follow up with them and do 24 hour lead conversion, just like we taught you with your clients and set up the interviews as fast as possible. And then you're going to build rapport in the interviews. And so if you actually took all the stuff you did to get your first paint job and use that to go out into the job market, you're going to find a ton of jobs and you're going to find a ton of you know, successful opportunities. And then you're going to have companies bidding against each other to have you come work there and be able to say, oh, I got a better offer somewhere else. Uh, because in the painting business, you can have 30 customers. Um, in the, your life, you can have one one job, probably. Um, so that's the process we try to teach. It sounds like that's what you had to kind of go through is going, hey, I can't just stick something on my resume and get to the front of the line everywhere. I still have to work my butt off to use the things on my resume to get me where I want to go. Oh, 100%. And that that is true in college works. It was true in a job search. It was also true, raising venture capital for Avail. Holy I cow, mean, yeah, we, we haven't gotten there yet. That's got to be- We, we haven't gotten there, difficult. but- Let's but go that, there. That, that funnel of ultimately raising about 10 million in outside capital to grow Avail. But in the last round, the round of funding that we raised was a $5 million round of funding. But it took literally thousands of leads at the top of the funnel to getting down to about 200 with different investors. And then you get to your five people who are willing to say yes. And then you ultimately work with one investor. I mean, so all of the, that funnel, the conversion, I mean, there, there's just so many similarities and you ultimately just have to have a lot of persistence and, and confidence that the numbers will work. So you get an idea to start a startup and then decide, you know, all right, I'm going to go to this accelerator. Was the accelerator before you started building the business or was it like just a back of a napkin idea? Did you already have something built before you get into the, the accelerator incubator? Yeah, we, so 
our, our journey was we started writing code for Avail in 2012. And we had built a product. We had tiny numbers of customers at that point. I mean, we were getting like one or two a week. And for, for comparison, now we're adding thousands per week. So it, we've come a long way. When we did the accelerator, that was the summer of 2014. So by that time, we had a product. We had some customers. We had some revenue. We had one or two people on the team. Got it. And then you, uh, why'd you pick the accelerator you picked or how did that come about? I mean, again, that that's another story of, look, there's there's a lot of programs out there and you, we were looking for a few things with with doing an accelerator program. We were looking for the, the stamp of approval, recognition, et cetera, that comes with doing a top accelerator program. We were looking to network with other founders and then we were also looking for some amount of like media backlinks to our website because that can help with SEO and, and how our, our site would show up in Google. So we had those three goals we went into that with. And then we said, what are the accelerators out there that we could potentially do? We applied for a bunch of them. We, we just followed that same, same sales process where we, we set up the interviews with them. We networked, we built the rapport. And then ultimately we had a few options of accelerator programs we could have done. We chose the one out in the Bay Area because it most closely aligned with the three goals that we had. Got it. And at this point, are you, do you have any source of income? Zero. Zero. So, so it's been whatever you had saved up is what you got to live on. Yep. It it had been two and a half years of not getting paid. There had to be some thought of like, if this doesn't work. So was if this didn't work, just did you have a job you wanted to go back to or a plan? Like, I'll just go paint some houses. What was the backup? As, as silly and as ridiculous as it sounds, I didn't. There was NB. I I was I was all in. Burn the boats. I was burn the boats. I was a hundred percent look through just sheer willpower, luck, whatever it is, we're gonna make this thing work. And I think it was perhaps that level of stupidity and conviction that ultimately is what led to it working. I'm not sure. Was there any hatred of like, I'm done with the banking world. I don't want to do that. I have to make this work. Or like, no, I liked it. I just wanted to go do the next thing. It would, no, it, I mean, what you're talking about is that trade off between fear and greed. Um, and so it wasn't so much like a hatred of the corporate world, but it was more just this like internal drive and motivation and desire. And maybe you'd term it greed to be able to have that flexibility, that freedom, that um, autonomy and financial freedom that comes with having a successful business. Got it. So it sounds like not even just greed for money, but greed for, I want to control my own destiny. I want to set my own hours. I want to be the boss. Yeah. I, I just want that autonomy. And, and I don't, I mean, in, in banking, people tell you what to do and what hours to be in the office pretty much whenever they want. And so it was just did not want to ever go back to, to being told what to do. Yeah. So if I'm going to work hundred hours a week, I might as well do it for myself. Um, I would totally and on my terms. Good. Yeah. Um, with some upside too, with some upside. So, yeah. Um, so you get the business going and it gets some traction. And I, I think at some point you had some investors that were some alumni of college works or somehow they got tied back into the business a little bit. Yeah, definitely. I think avail was, um, I think one of our claims with fame was we we're the, for maybe the first check from CWP ventures um back in the day so it was just really you know a, a great thing how that came full circle and i talk about kind of manufacturing serendipity and and all of that and and creating more doors for yourself i mean that was a, a great example of did the did the college works program didn't know where it would lead and it ultimately came back and and a number of the the college works uh, folks invested in Avail, which was 
you know, a, a great thing. And fortunately we made them, made them all a little bit of money. Nice. So yeah. And that's kind of a crazy, you know, it's something we deal with every day. So we don't think about like, Oh, that being that special or crazy, but you think about a college student working at a place as an intern for a summer. And then 10 years later, a bunch of the founders and owners of that business going, yeah, here's a bunch of money for your next venture and still being, you know, that's crazy. Yeah. And, and just the power of the relationship power of, you know, putting yourself out there. And, and you just think about if you, as a college student, you never have most college students, I'm not going to say all, but most college students likely don't have that foresight to know that that's where things could lead. But that that would be one plug for for the College Works program is just the network, not only with with the leaders at the time, but but even your fellow interns, right? Like you, you it's an opportunity to build great relationships that can and will last for a long time. Yeah, and you don't know if that kid sitting next to you in finance class is going to be your co-founder of a new company, right. or if you know that professor um, that is going to wind up leaving professorship to become an executive somewhere and they're going to become a customer. And so many serendipitous moments I've had where I went and did a little startup stint and um, we were looking at a website tool that was going to help our website. And I'm like, oh my gosh, the global head of sales for that company who used to run a big sales team at Google is one of my old interns. Um, I'll just give him a call and see you know, if their software would fit our needs. And uh, there's so many of those little things that you don't realize, but you know that that trust you get reciprocated because they see the work ethic. They saw, well, man, if you were in college and you were willing to put your weekends into knocking on doors and run a painting business, and you were able to make it profitable and have good customer service, and you could deal with employees, like you're probably somebody we could bet on if you have a good idea. Now, if you give us a bad business idea, we might not invest, <laughs> but you know, you have a good idea and that work ethic, that seems like a pretty no brainer for. Uh, an investor. So I could totally see why they, why they invested. So <clears throat> let's get back to the excellent stuff. So at, at any point in there, did you feel like, you know, I'm, I'm becoming pretty excellent at this. Like I'm going to be somebody who, you know, is going to be big in the prop tech world, or I'm going to achieve the, the goals I have in my career. Um, at what point did you really start to see that? Like I'm doing this right. Yeah. There was a moment when I think it was, at some point in, I'm going to say it was 2018, 19 or early 2020, where with the business, we had figured out really the repeatable process. We had figured out that flywheel that was working for us, where we would invest in sales and marketing. We would get customers. The business was working. The unit economics were working. We had an amazing team. My co-founder and I were getting along really well. Um, you know, everything was just clicking. And so I go back to almost that def definition of excellence that I shared earlier, where, you know, we were achieving great things. We were growing quickly. We were raising venture money. We were doing really well. And I think by a lot of people's kind of definitions or, or a lot of people's opinions would be we were kind of making it look easy in a way where things were just clicking we knew what we were doing we were operating at at high speed high velocity and it just it felt really good to be in that flow in that moment and was there a particular thing that you feel like you do really well that other people could follow that maybe they're in a different field or different industry, but a skill or a habit that's like, this is what allows me to perform excellently at what I do. Yeah. I think the thing that I landed on and I, I still try and I'm not perfect at, but I try and do really well is trying to be ultra deliberate and intentional with my time and my effort. And so it really comes down to, making sure that you understand what it what exactly it is that you're trying to accomplish at any given point in time and understand why and once you have clarity around those things you're able to just operate at this extremely high level where you can block out all of the noise you can 
you can really be so laser focused on accomplishing that one goal. And that goal will change over time. But I find that it's it's extremely valuable to have just one thing that you're knocking on at a time rather than trying to do a lot of things at maybe a mediocre level. So you're talking one thing, you're talking one thing for the next hour, one thing for the next day. How long is that one thing focused on or does it depend on the thing? I It all depends on the thing. And so when I go back to a veil, you know, I, I found that a lot of my time as a CEO was focused on, look, making sure we had money in the bank. I had to be out there meeting with investors, raising capital. Um, and so what I did is I set up the process, the procedures, the team in a way that allowed me to go out and do that one thing that I needed to do to make sure the business thrived. And so I, I found someone who was great at operations and leading our team. My co-founder was unbelievable at those things. He, he set a great direction for the team, motivated the hell out of them, et cetera. Um, that allowed me to go out there and basically fly across the country, meet investors almost every day. And when I had that clarity around all that I need to do at the moment is sell the company vision and get investors excited, everything else will work out. Then like that's what ultimately helped us get to that that high level. And you're still hearing no all the time from those investors. All how the time. You, I mean Yeah, how do you overcome that? I think a lot uh, a lot of it is is it's it's really two things. So what I would say is you've got to have have confidence, almost an irrational confidence in what you're doing and what you're selling. You have to believe. You have to have. And then number two, you also just have to trust that it's a numbers game. And it's no different than going out, knocking on a thousand doors for, for painting. And you know, statistically, and I imagine that CollegeWorks tracks this and, and shares this with, with interns, but if you go out and knock on a thousand doors, you're going to get a certain number of warm leads. And from those warm leads, you're going to get a certain number of estimates. From those estimates, you're going to get some percentage of book jobs. And those, that data is out there in my world in, in venture, in raising venture money. And if you just trust the probabilities and you're willing to put in the effort and believe in yourself, like the, the math should all revert to the mean. It should, it, it will work out and you just have to kind of have that blind trust that it will. And it sounds like you were in a real positive headspace during this. Like, the way you're talking about it is like the 90s bulls last dance and like we're just, <laughs> we're clicking and things are awesome and it's fun and, um, you know, it's it's busy, but, you know, it's an awesome ride, but you're probably getting rejected five out of 10 times, eight out of 10 times, like pretty consistently. And yet you still have this confidence and belief of like, and it's going great. I'm so pumped about it. And I'm batting, you know, a hundred or I'm batting 200, but I love it. <laughs> How do you maintain that? Yeah, it, I mean, it, it is hard and it's not, um, there, there were definitely a handful of kind of, um, investor rejections that stung a bit because you do look at a at a couple investors and you're like, man, that, that person really took the time to understand our business and they still said no. But the majority of them, Sean, was like, I, I would hear no from an investor and they would say, you know, we don't think real estate is a big market. It's like you, it's the biggest market there is. You 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 get like I, I you just laugh at them. You're just like you don't get it. And ultimately, you just have to have some humility about it. Where you're like, look, maybe they didn't deserve to be a part of our team. And so, um, what I found was a lot of the people that would say no to us were 
ultimately they weren't the right investor for for the business, not vice versa. So I, an analogy I use is, you know, I think of my customers are already out there and I got to go find them. And so I'm going to paint 30 houses in Rockford, Illinois this summer. And they're going to love to hire a college student. They're going to love to hire me. We're going to do a great job in their house. And like those, it's going to happen, but I have to go find them. Um, they're like Easter eggs that are hidden around my territory in their home. And I'm knocking on their door going, hey, are you my customer? No, I'm not your customer. Okay, sorry. Have a good day. Are you my customer? Nope. Oh, okay. Sorry. Have a good day. Are you my customer? I I might be your customer. Oh, great. Awesome. I was looking for you. And that's kind of the mindset I had was like, they're out there. I just got to find them. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that, that comes back to that data that I was saying, where it's like, you just have to have that blind conviction at a certain point that you've got a good product and that there are customers out there that want what you're selling, whether it's painting their house or whether it's selling a stake in whatever exciting tech startup you've got, it's going to work out. You now have had tons of different customers. You've had house painting customers, you've had uh, banking customers, you've had um, landlords that are customers, but also investors that are customers. And then all of a sudden uh, you have giant companies are your customer trying to gobble you up. Uh, so talk a little bit about the journey there of how do you, uh, the acquisition, I haven't been through that. I've been through a startup where um, I got a chance to help raise venture capital and be on a team doing that. And I've seen all that. I've never seen the acquisition side. What was that like? Yeah, our our acquisition process was a bit unique in that we raised our five, raised a $5 million round of funding in June of 2020. And then in July of 2020, so a month later, we had a really large company knocking on our door that was seriously looking at, bu looking at buying the company. And this really large company that was looking to buy us, um, I mean, they were, they were all in, but to give you a sense of like how big it was, they had 50 lawyers on one of the first due diligence calls. <laughs> we had it's, it's 40, like a $100,000 call. A hundred thousand easily. And we had 40 employees. So they have 50 lawyers and we had 40 total employees at our company. <laughs> Just like mind blowing. And so um, it was an exciting time. I'll also like remind everyone that was during the pandemic. That was four months, five months into this global pandemic where everyone was working virtually, doing things virtually. So I was, here I was sitting in our office in River North in Chicago, this old brick and timber kind of loft startup office. I was by myself. I had this, this TV monitor in front of me that had 50 little one inch boxes on it for each of the lawyers. And I, here I am just fielding these calls myself or fielding these questions myself. So wild experience. Um, we went through their diligence process and then ultimately by, it was really the end of August that they came to us and they're like, look, this deal is going to our executive committee for approval and you'll have our term sheet for the acquisition within a week. And so here I am sitting here saying, you know, this is incredible. This is potentially life-changing for my co-founder, me, everyone on our team had equity in the business. And I'm just like, beside, like, it, it is a, a very cool feeling. But then I started thinking about like, look, just like painting houses, just like, you know, selling whatever service, you ultimately want to make sure that you've got multiple customers competing for your business. And so what I did at that point is I pulled out a list that I had built of who are the 10 most likely companies to acquire Avail. And over the prior seven years, I had methodically built out this like top 10 list and who is not just the company, but who is that one person at each company that I've built a relationship with, what is their cell phone number? What's their, like, how, when was the last time I talked to them? I've got this Google sheet. And so who's the head of corp dev 
or mergers and acquisitions at name a big big tech company. Um, I, I was very careful about building that out over over the course of building building the company. So here I am. I, I said to our board of directors, I said, look, if we're considering this this acquisition proposal from company A, we need to go talk to companies one through ten. And so I sent out 10 emails or text messages that night to these other 10. And it was actually realtor.com that got back to us pretty quickly. And they're like, can we talk at 9 a.m. tomorrow? And I had three months prior been told the rentals business at realtor.com was not a priority. So here I was like this weird kind of situation where we thought company A was going to buy us. Realtor.com, who said, hey, this isn't a priority, said, like, they immediately raised their hand. They're like, let's talk as soon as we can. Did a call with them. That led ultimately to Realtor.com getting us a term sheet in like a week and a half. It was, it was unbelievably fast. And then ultimately, we had a couple of options for the company. But basically 110 days later or so we were announcing to our company and and publicly that realtor.com had had acquired avail awesome man congrats on that that's incredible um uh, incredible success so if you go back and think about some of those early moments in your 20s and you know we talked about being deliberate and intentional with your time and uh, really uh, learning how to focus and uh, finding harmony and looking for serendipity. Um, some really great stuff today. What would be some key things that you want to know that, you, you know, 20 year old Ryan's listening to this right now. What's, what do you want him to understand? Yeah, I think the number one thing is around creating as much optionality for yourself as possible, but doing that in a very deliberate, intentional way. So if I think about what ultimately led to Avail being for you know a mid eight figure sum, it would be that we we had built that list of ten potential acquirers, and we didn't do it just for for the the sake of doing it. We did it so that at some point in the future we can pull out this list and we can call or text the ten people that would buy the business. So it's it's really about whether it was that, whether it's, you know, deciding to get out of bed and go knock on doors in the spring and, and sell more, sell more painting jobs, like decide what it is that you want in five or 10 years, visualize yourself in that situation, and then work backwards, understand how you're going to get there. And then every day, wake up and, and, and pursue that path work work towards that plan awesome man well i really appreciate you being on today i think this is an excellent preview of what's to come for a lot of our alumni and seeing that there's a there's a path that's maybe going to zigzag um, it's not laid out step by step but there's so many open doors and so many things that this can lead to um, and super exciting to catch up with you and see what you've been up to after since intern year 20 years ago today and who would have thought um, I would still be sticking around running college works. You would be um, about to find the next thing after you've sold your company um, and done all these other things. So uh, really great to talk to you again today, man. I really appreciate you being on the show. Yeah, thanks again, Sean. Really appreciate it. It was great catching up. Great seeing you. Um, look forward to staying in touch and, and um, being helpful. And if anyone out there in those CW, college works universe um, could use any help or, or wants to talk about anything, um, find me on LinkedIn. Always happy to help and, and do anything I can. Thanks, man.